of the Greek philosopher, famous for many things, one of them being that he encouraged people to uh, know <coughs> thyself. He said that one should know oneself, right? Um, and what's true of people, and philosophy in general, is true of universal constructions in category as well. And if Socrates had been uh, a category theorist, he might have said that we should probe thyself. <laughs> And I know that sounds a little gross, but trust me, it's useful. Um, and so what I mean by this is whenever we define a universal construction, we should immediately ask what happens when the such that for any blah, blah, blah part that we state in part of the definition is the thing itself that we just define, right? So what that means is, right, if we take x, to be T itself, what do we learn? Right? From the definition, we know that, okay, here's T, the terminal object. Now I'm setting X to be T2, T also. And I'm asserting that there's this unique map, the bang map, from, from T to itself. Right? That's, that's, necessarily part of what it, that's necessarily what it means to be a terminal object. Okay, but what path do we know has to be in the home set from T to T by the definition of category? ID. Right. Exactly. So we know that ID T lives here too. And notice I'm using this convention when I draw diagrams. I won't, like, here I'm not writing ID T and here I'm not writing bang T because you can infer it because you can see the domain and codomain of the arrow of the diagram. So it's a common notational shorthand to draw the sort of the T part here and infer. X part, which is your T. But the point is that what have we just discovered? Well, this is what we'll call identity expansion. In this case, for terminal objects. And so I should call this a lemma, I guess, because we just proved it. Uh, that the bang of a terminal object T is equal to the identity map on that object. Right? And the notation here is a little bit ambiguous because like, the bang doesn't tell you which terminal object it is, but here like, we mean both the domain and codomain are T. Right? In order for this to make sense, the domain and codomain have to both be T because we know that's true from this side, so we can infer it from this side. Okay? So this is what we learn by probing a terminal object with itself. <coughs> Thank you, Socrates. <laughs> so I told you at the top that, uh, that universal constructions are unique up to a canonical isomorphism. Right? In this case, let's uh, look at the uniqueness property for terminal objects. Okay, in this case, terminal objects are unique up to a unique ISO. Okay. If it's not clear what I mean by that, it will become clear when I show you why it's true. Okay. So whenever we have these kinds of theorems where we're trying to assert something is unique, if you take in you know, a discrete math class or a basic algebra class, you know the general technique is you posit two contenders and then you have them fight it out. And then you discover that they're actually the same all along. So I call this the uh, fight club method of proof. Uh, so if and R are both terminal. Okay, then I'm going to draw you a diagram. From T, we know there's the unique map to R 
because R is terminal. So I'm going to call this little T because we're going to have a lot of unique maps running around. And because T is terminal, right, there's a unique map from R to T, which I'll call little r. But because T is terminal, there's a unique map from T to T, which is the bang of T. But we just discovered by identity expansion that this is the identity map of T. Right? So depending on your level of comfort with you know, diagrammatic reasoning, this may be like a very clear and, and insightful way of describing an argument, or it might just be a bunch of gobbledygook. So let me try to explain it again. So I'm saying that T followed by R must be the same as bang of T. Why? Because T is terminal, and there's only one arrow from T to T. This is an arrow from T to T, so it must be this one. Okay. By identity expansion, we know that that one must be the identity. And therefore, T composed R is the identity. If we swap the roles of the objects T and R, then we discover that R uh, that arrow, R composed the arrow T, is also the identity, this time on the object R. Right? So from our definition of isomorphism last time, we conclude <coughs> that the arrow T is an iso. But now, by the universal property of R, there is only one map from T to R, right? And so T is the only possible map in the whole Hom set, and it's an ISO, so it has to be the only ISO in there, right? So it's the only one. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I'm asserting that there's a unique isomorphism between T and R, right? Now, I've proved that there's an isomorphism between T and R. And furthermore, because R is a terminal object, there's a unique morphism, let forget about whether it's iso or not, between T and R, from T to R. So I've given you an isomorphism from T to R, and I know that there's only one morphism at all from T to R, so there must be no more isomorphisms from T to R. Got it? Yeah. It's a little bit subtle, but it's like all of this comes down to the definition. Okay, so because terminal objects, oh, yes. So when, when you say t dot r equals ID, you're asserting that if I have two paths between two objects on the diagram, then those, the corresponding error compositions must be the same, must be equal. Yes, I'm asserting that this composite, remember by the definition of category, we have two composable arrows, they always have a composite. So I'm asserting that this composite arrow is identical to this error, right? It's equal in the equational theory of the error. It, it does, so does the diagram say that if I have, I mean, could I imagine having a diagram where I have two errors between two different objects and those are not the same? Yes, of course. And so does this diagram say that this particular diagram has the property that if I have two errors between two objects, they're always the same? Oh, 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 so you're asking about the diagrammatic language, the, the picture? Okay, so uh, I don't remember if I mentioned this or not, if it was in lecture or in response to a private question, but there are many conventions about when we draw a diagram, whether we assume it commutes or not. Right? So some people, when they draw a diagram where there is a region enclosed by two paths, just the fact that there is that region means that they're asserting that the diagram commutes. In some cases, that's people like will draw, say, puncture, to, assert, to, to say that I'm drawing that there are two paths here, but I'm not asserting that they commute or something like that. Or some people will just not assume that there's like any commutation condition at all unless they say it in words. So I'm using my words to say that I'm asserting that this diagram commutes. Okay. So because terminal objects are like so strongly unique, as unique as you could possibly get with a behavioral description, we, we call an arbitrary terminal object, uh, uh, so we write 
one or a terminal object. Okay. This is a little bit ambiguous because there could be more than one terminal object in a category. And when I write one, it's, I'm not saying which one, but in a way it doesn't matter because they're all related by a unique isomorphism. So like it's, it's as precise as it needs to be behaviorally. Okay. And before you, before you switch, um, yes. so when you, you know, when, when you do the diagram, so we typically don't put like T and then parentheses, you know, or the bang, you don't put the parentheses T there. Yes. <laughs> but I see in, when you did T compose R equals ID T, you, you seem to put it there. And I just, yes, because, okay, so here there's, a, it's not next to the picture anymore, right? So you might not. Okay, if I wanted to be completely precise, what I would do here is I would write parentheses T, but then I would need a subscript T here too, because I need to say the bang to which terminal object, well T, coming from which object, well T. But when I draw the picture, it's clear, because you can just look and see what the domain and the codomain of that arrow is, whereas when I talk about the, when I write equationally, you have to sort of elaborate out in your mind what is the domain and codomain of each morphism, right? And I need to provide you enough information so that you can do this mental elaboration. Alternatively, I could write everything in the notation, but then the notation gets very heavy and hard to look at. So, I mean, this is sort of a human medium where we have to decide how much, you know, how much concision do we want for clarity and how much um, precision do we want to convey the right information. And it turns out if you check, right, with this information, you can elaborate out to know what the domain and codomain of each arrow is. Okay, so. Let's not think, I mean, that's kind of a side topic to what I really want to talk about, but we can talk about it later if you want. Uh, so the point is, when I draw diagrams, I can leave off some labels because it's clear from the context of the other objects and arrows in the diagram. Okay. So now, yeah. So now I will give you a little exercise, which should not take you more than a few seconds, hopefully. Category. I 
I'm going to call this a preorder category. That then you tell me. Okay, so you can think about these. They're also in the notes. our first universal construction, we already have enough uh, structure to interpret our first propositional connector. So that's what I'm going to tell you about next. people have asked me, what does it mean actually to interpret logic, right? And what I mean is not some kind of deep philosophical statement. What I mean is just taking one formal system and translating it into another formal system in a way that preserves the composition structure of the original formal system, right? So what it, in this case, it means that I'm going to tell you how to take the parts of, of intuitionistic logic and turn them into features in category, in categories in such a way that it maintains their, their, um, their structure and behavior. <coughs> that will become more clear as we go on. But in, in any case, the truth um, propositional constant, right? I think Frank has been writing it like this, the, the top symbol, which looks a lot like my uppercase T, but it's different somehow. Uh, we interpret as And now, these funny brackets, the double brackets, that just means the interpretation of it. Okay, so interpretation is some kind of function, right? I'm going to be a little bit vague about this intentionally, that's taking one formal system to another, and then I have to tell you what it does for each thing. Right? So this means I take the true propositional constant, and I take it to a terminal object in some category, some category with a terminal object, obviously. Otherwise, And, okay, now truth has an introduction rule. So I have to tell you how to interpret that. So let's remember what that is, right? We can write it variously. So I think this was the way Frank wrote it. Uh, try to remember the notation. Okay, so um, this is slightly inconvenient for what we're trying to do because it doesn't notate syntactically what the, the context of assumptions of this are. Right? So if it's a proof, then there are no assumptions. But in general, a derivation might have some open assumptions. Right? And so um, one way we can do this is if we use uh, what Frank briefly alluded to today, but didn't really describe a kind of localized notation for natural deduction, where we, at each point, include what the context is. Then we can write this like this, right? That's supposed to be a gamma. Let's try again. And this says that for no assumptions, in any context, we can infer truth. Okay, I'm going to introduce another notation which is not syntactically correct natural deduction, so Frank might yell at me, but it conveys the same idea, and I'll say in words why this is the case, right? I'll put over here sort of to the side, you can imagine, but above the line, the context gamma, and below the conclusion. <coughs> so however we express this, the idea is that from any context, we can infer truth right, from no assumptions. And the point here is that if we had some other context that we somehow use to prove the things in this context, then we could compose them. So we haven't talked about that yet, but this idea of compositionality is going to come in. Okay, so now I need to tell you how to interpret this. So, the interpretation of the intro rule is just defined to be the bang map on the interpretation of the context, and that has the type or the boundary interpretation of gamma to 
right? Because remember what I said on the first day, the general goal is we want to interpret propositions and propositional contexts as objects in some kind of category, and derivations as arrows. And the inference rules are the primitive derivations. We build derivations by putting together an inference rule, by combining them, right? So we build up arrows by combining, loosely speaking, uh, other arrows. And so this is a primitive arrow, and I'm telling you now which primitive arrow it is. Does this make sense? Okay. So, truth has no limb rule, so there's nothing to interpret there. And Frank has talked about the harmony of the connective, so eventually I'm going to have to tell you about why this interpretation preserves harmony, why it's a harmonious interpretation. But I'm going to do that tomorrow, when we can do it sort of in a uniform way for all of the connectives. So for now, we're going to leave that in the bank. And just uh, just stick to the intro and the limbo ones for the connectives. So, so now let's put on our uh, our duality hats and see where one of the, the big uh, features of category theory really shines, and that's that you can. For any construction, there's always a dual construction, right? That's what I told you uh, on the first day, I think. No, on the second day, because I went over time. So, um, if we take the dual construction to a terminal ob uh, yeah, to a terminal object, what should that be? Okay, so that's called an initial object. Wait, there's some letters missing. Object is an object, let's call it S, <coughs> such that for any object X, and what am I going to write here? There's a unique something. What is that something? Yeah, I'll call it little s. And where will it go? S to S. From S to S. Right? So this is a terminal object in the opposite category, or an initial object in this category. So it's we just we just reverse the order, the, the orientation or the boundary of the arrow. Right? So this, so by analogy, right, we typically refer to this map S when it's unambiguous as uh, the Cobang map, which is an upside down exclamation point, but also has the advantage of looking like an I for initial objects. So you can remember that. Uh, and so this says, right, let me draw this. Oh, uh, yeah. And we usually refer to, oh, well, okay. So here's S, here's X, here's the map that I'm asserting exists, right? and this is the cobang of X. <coughs> or I can even not write this X. Okay, so uh, just using duality, we can already prove a bunch of things about initial objects, right? Basically everything we proved about terminal objects, we just take the dual thing about initial objects. So. Um, so what does identity expansion tell us about initial objects? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to re refer to an arbitrary initial object as zero. Uh, we'll write zero or S. Okay. So identity expansion for initials tells us that the cobang of zero is what? Well, okay, I kind of give it away. Right? The identity. So you can just take the result for terminal objects, apply duality, and get this immediately. 
Or, it might be a good exercise, if that seems unfamiliar to you, to look at the proof that we did and go through the proof step by step that's reversing the orientation of all the arrows involved. And you'll get the same result. Okay, so there's also this uniqueness condition. And that tells us what? That initial, initial objects are unique up to what's the dual of a unique ISO? It's just a unique ISO, right? <laughs> Because the rule of an ISO is an ISO. If I didn't give that to you as an assignment before, you can, you can check it. Okay, and now the, uh, the exercise that I gave you about composition with a bang, we can do the dual of that. says that if I have an arrow i from x to y, and I have an initial object with the required, oh, yeah, okay, good, I did the dotted lines, with the required cobang maps, why is it that when I compose this cobang with this arrow, I get this cobang? Okay, so initial objects in sets are empty sets, as you can check, and in categories, they're empty categories, as you can also check. So now we have enough information to interpret our second connective. Oh, look at this, this is great. So hard to make this work. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so Paul said we write as bottom, right? It's the opposite of top. And what should its interpretation be in a category? Well, okay. I, I've been telling you all about it. It's an initial object. And instead of an intro rule here, right? all of this. Okay, it'll just be confusing. So. Here we have an elliptical. Right? And this is written from bottom, we can infer A for any proposition A. Okay? So this is bottom and then. But okay, there's a subtlety here that I'm going to come back to later, so I'm going to put a little like dagger on this rule because I have to say something about it, but not until we introduce some other stuff. But we're going to interpret this as the Cobang map. Right. And where does that go? It goes from the interpretation of falsehood to the interpretation of whatever arbitrary proposition we chose to conclude by using this rule. are universal constructions, but they're kind of trivial uh, in a sense. So it's kind of hard to see uh, what's going on. In particular, the thing that seems like they're, that's part of the construction is actually part of the, uh, the universality. So let's do a uh, universal construction that's not trivial in that sense, and then we'll see sort of what's going on more clearly. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so um, remember that we talked last time about uh, last time, I think it's probably last time, about products of sets and this construction that we did that we called the product of categories, right? That was just ordered pairs all around, ordered pairs of objects, ordered pairs of arrows, ordered pairs of identities, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, and I told you at that time to think about those phrases as sort of proper nouns or in scare quotes because now we're going to introduce a construction that we call the product. And then we're going to check that those that those definitions actually have this property, right? They are, they have the property of being this instance of this universal construction. So a product of objects in some category. A and B. is what I'm going to call a span, and I'm going to explain this in just a second, on A and B. And what I mean by that is a pair of arrows that have the same domain, so let's call this common domain P, and the codomains are respectively A and B. Okay, so this is what I mean by a span sort of think about it like the span of a bridge or something. Okay, so that's the, that's the shape, right? When I said before that a universal construction has a certain shape, in this case the shape is a span. So that for any span on A and B, so here's our candidate. Okay, so this is the vocabulary. 
Does it make sense so far? Okay, I'll leave that up. Continue. So now we're going to do some familiar uh, verifications. <coughs> Is T X zero X one? Yeah. But what does that mean, right? Yeah. X zero and X one have codomains A and B respectively, and this arrow has a codomain that's the object P. So what does it mean for it to be X zero X one? So I'm just trying to interpret that equality you wrote there in the, in the diagram. Here? In the diagram. Okay. So this says that if I take the arrow T, and I compose it with the arrow P0, yeah. that composition is equal to the arrow X1. Okay. And if I take the arrow T, and I compose it with the arrow P1, that composition is equal to the arrow X1. But I also read T equal... Oh, these are angle brackets. So this is a notation, a syntactic sugar, if you will, to refer to the unique map from X to P, which is the tuple of X0 and X1. So instead of writing out that long... Oh. Description, I just write angle bracket x0 comma x1 close angle bracket. Okay? Question. You don't use the bang uh, notation in that diagram to indicate the uniqueness? Here, there's the unique map yeah. T. Oh, you're saying here. Yes. Okay, so. I see some people just yes, so the question is how. So the, so the question from the audience is like, should I put a bang here or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So. There are many versions of the graphical language of diagrams that one can use with various levels of you know, precision and various levels of concision, let's say. Right? And in my case, I'm writing out what I need in like words or symbols, and then I'm drawing the diagram to give you the idea. So there's nothing in this, if you, just, if you just look at this picture, there's nothing to say that this arrow is unique. But I'm telling you that it's unique. Right? So one could do that, but I'm choosing not to. Okay, so let's, uh, well, let's talk for T's dictum. And so what should we do to our product that we've just met? Exactly. We probe it with itself. So what does that mean? Here we have P. Uh, and it's projections. <coughs> Sorry, this was a vocabulary word. I should have underlined it. And then here, we make the candidate span be the same span, right? And what does the universal property tell us? So if there's a unique map from P to P, which is the tuple, <coughs> of P0 and P1. Can we think of a map oh, that makes the two triangles commute? Right? Can we think of a map from P to P such that that map followed by P0 is P0 and that map followed by P1 is P1? Any guesses? Identity, right? So the identity does the job. So we learn identity expansion For products says that the tuple of the projections is equal to the identity of the product, or of the object at the apex of the product, which we usually refer to as the product a bit sloppily. Okay, so that's that. Um, how about the uniqueness property? So 
here is where we see how the uh, terminal and initial objects were a bit degenerate, right? So in this case, we have the fact, okay, so this is a lemma. <coughs> products of, ob of a pair of, ob products of a given pair of objects, when they exist, are unique up to a something preserving iso. Okay, that something is supposed to be the structure of the product, so the shape. So what do you think that that should be? Well, we want these two triangles to commute, right? And so what, what lets us do that is the projection. So this is going to be the projection. So the isomorphism is going to have to preserve the projection. But we don't have to know that up front. We can discover it. Okay, so the way we prove this is by Mike Club. We have two contenders. So say we have objects A and B and a product and another product. The fact that this one is a product means that there's a unique map here. Right, let's call this S. But now we can do this again. And the fact that this one is a product means that there's a unique map here. Let's call that T. So now let's look what happens when we take S composed with T composed with one of the projections. So I'm going to write PI to refer to you know, either of them in turn. So because P is a product, that means that these bottom triangles can be, right? So S followed by T followed by, to pick one, P0, is just S followed by Q0, because P is a product, right? So that's S followed by QI. But now we just use the fact that Q is a product. And what do we know about S followed by Q0? It's just P0 again. Okay, I'm going to continue over here. Okay, so we've discovered that S followed by T is the tuple of P0 and P1, right, from, uh, from P to P. But by identity expansion, we know that this is the identity on P, right? So S followed by T is the identity. <coughs> if we reverse the roles of P and Q, we get similarly uh, T followed by S is the identity, this time on Q. And so S is an ISO, right? And now by the universal property of Q, of being a product, it's got to be the only one that respects the projection. Right, that's what this says. There's a unique map here that respects the projections. And the only one respecting the projection. So I'm not going to go through these lemmas in detail for the further uh, connectives, but this is how they all work. And you always do the same thing. To get identity expansion, you probe the thing with itself. To get uniqueness property, you assume that there are two uh, contenders and you have them fight it out. Uh, okay, so because products are as unique as they can be behaviorally, right, unique up to a unique projection preserving 
isomorphism. We'll use the following notation, which I'll write as soon as I finish erasing.
I have an arbitrary object here, and I have maps f and g, and another object, and an arrow here i, and here I have the tuple. So what I've drawn here, this arrow composed with this arrow, is the left-hand side of this equation, right? But I can take i and compose it with f, Right, there's always the composite here, I compose F, and that's an arrow from Y to A, and similarly, I have this arrow, I compose G, and that's an arrow from Y to B. So if we have <coughs> products, if we have a product of A and D, there's a unique map from here to here, right? and I'm asking you to tell me why this tuple is the same as the composition of this with this tuple. Okay. that we can define products not only on objects of a category, which is what we just defined, right, the product of two objects, but we can also define a product for arrows of a category. So let me explain that to you. by this arrow, then I get half of a span, right, from here to A. And if I follow this projection by this arrow, I get the other half. So these two composites give me a span from A over A and B. Right? So the universal property of the product tells me that there's a unique map here, this one. And I'm defining that to be what we mean by F cross G. <coughs> Does it make sense? So what I've done in categories that we can't really, well, what, what I've done is I've defined a product construction not only on objects, but on arrows as well, right? And why this is useful is that this lets us <coughs> this lets us define a functor called the product functor. Okay, so if category C has products or objects, <coughs> there's a functor that we write like this, blank cross blank. <coughs> Say, let me write this and then explain it. Okay, so what's going on here? There's a lot of crosses here, so this is confusing, right? So this is the name of an alleged functor. 
Okay? So if it's a functor, it has to have a domain and a codomain. Its codomain is clear, it's the category in question. What's its domain? This is the product of categories, small categories, uh, it should say small. There. Uh, construction that we did yesterday, right? It's just the syntactic thing of making ordered pairs. The objects are ordered pairs, the errors are ordered pairs, the identities are ordered pairs, and so on. Okay, so I think I'm not going to go through why this is the case, but if you're interested, uh, you should look at it in, your, in the notes, but we will need to use this later, which is why I bring it up. I'm not just torturing you out of cruelty. Um, so we need to know that there is such a functor, right? But it's, uh, the fact that that definition of product of arrows lets us define it is a proof you can read it in it. Okay, so now we have enough structure to interpret another connective. Interpretation 
of A and B, which is the product of A and B, which is, gives it the right domain and codomain. So does that make sense? Can you say that one more time? Sure. Okay, so do you, I'm sorry, do you remember the product diagram? Right, so if we have projections, we have, okay, I'm just going to write gamma, but I need the interpretation of it. Right, so here, if I have something that I interpret as an arrow from the interpretation of gamma to the interpretation of A, something that I interpret as an arrow from the interpretation of gamma to the interpretation of B, we know that there has to be this tuple arrow, right? And it's going from the interpretation of gamma to the interpretation of A and B, which is the product of the interpretation of A and the interpretation of B. So I said, but didn't write all the interpretation brackets. Does that make sense now? It's going to be, okay, so I didn't, uh, okay, so if you assume that the way you get from gamma to A is the derivation called D0, and the way you get from gamma to B is the derivation that I'm calling C1, then this is going to be the interpretation of D0 tupled with the interpretation of D1. So it's whatever is here, right, there are two, there, this is like a function of two arguments. It wants to input derivations, and it gives you back a new derivation whose domain is this and whose domain is this. Okay, uh, we're not quite done with the rules because there's also a limit. So here, right, the rules, let me just remind you, from A and B, we can infer A. And from A and B, we can infer B. And this should be pretty obvious, right? So how could we possibly get from the interpretation of A and B, namely the product of A and B, to the interpretation of A? Hmm. Right. So the interpretation of the numeral the i illiberal is justified to be the i projection, right, where i ranges over 0 and 1. Okay, so now we've got intro and illiberals for truth, falsehood, and conjunction. Okay, so far so good. Okay, hope you're not hungry. <laughs> so I want to go on a little digression, but it's actually useful because it will help us understand something that I'm about to do next more clearly. And that is, if you remember on the very first day after I gave the definition of a category, and then I said, well, this is sort of a, a reasonably tractable way to axiomatize it, but what's really going on is this unbiased thing. You remember I made the analogy with the Lego? And so, like, composition shouldn't be thought of as something that's like a binary operation. It's kind of an n array operation. You just take a path of n arrows that are composable, and you can put them together to make a unique composite. So that was the unbiased view of um, composition. But now, I want to talk about the unbiased view of products. Okay, so I want to say, what happens if we try to make products for an arbitrary number of factors, it's not just two? Okay, so let's do a little thought experiment. What should be a null array product? So, what does the, the definition say? It says that a product, okay, so, before I do that, let me draw sort of a schematic picture here. So an n array product is going to be some object P with projections uh, what I call it? Okay. onto n factors right, 
right? So it's an object that does nary span, so it has n projections, such that for any other nary span, what's the universal property? That there's a unique map between the apices, if that's the word, <coughs> which is the nary tuple. Probably illegible to you, but the point is that that's the nary tuple, right, of the legs of the candidate span. Does it make sense? What I'm doing is I'm taking the definition of a binary product and I'm just generalizing it over the number of factors that we were considering. Okay, so let's consider what happens when we have zero factors, right? That says we have an object P with no projections onto its zero tuples such that for any candidate nullary, uh, any candidate object x with no legs of a span, there's a unique map from x to p satisfying no commuting triangle requirement. Okay? So this is the null tuple, but what universal construction already has this universal property? Yeah, the terminal object, right? So this is isomorphic to a terminal object. You could just say it is a terminal object because we can only define them up to this canonical isomorphism. So it's, it, it has exactly the same property that a terminal object has. How about a unary one? So that is an object P with one factor, I'll call it A, and one projection onto that one factor such that for any other object x, that's a one-ary span to A, so that is just an arrow to A, right? There's a unique map from x to P, namely the one-tuple, making this diagram commute. Okay, so this seems like it's pretty easy to satisfy, right? Because we can just always choose P to be A itself, choose this projection to be the identity, and then the one tuple is just the arrow itself. Right? So if P is defined to be A and I is defined to be the identity, then the one tuple of X is just X. So the unary product is just the identity function. Right? It just gives you back the arrow that you gave it. Of the isomorphism. Okay, binary products we already saw. And so what happens if we try to do three or more, right? So what if we try to consider A cross B cross C? Well, it takes a little bit of work, which I don't have time to go through now. But it turns out that the universal property of a ternary product is the same as, there's a canonical isomorphism too, in other words, this product, this iterated binary product, and in fact, also to this iterated binary product, because I'm sure the first thing you'll ask is, well, what's special about that association? And the answer is nothing. And the reason is because uh, products are associative up to a canonical face of morphism. Always, we're always going to have this, we're never going to get on the nose when we do a behavioral description of something because we just can't distinguish between different things that behave exactly the same way. Okay, so products are associative. But we, okay, so um, furthermore, <coughs> products are unital up to ISO, canonical ISO, and we start writing CI. <coughs> uh, so that means, in particular, that 
the product of one and any object is canonically isomorphism, canonically isomorphic to that object, which is canonically isomorphic to the product of that object we have, the terminal object F. Okay. I'm sure this is familiar from other settings, but it, it's true in general for uh, for products in any category. And furthermore, <coughs> products uh, that are symmetric, again, up to Canonical ISO. And what that means, I'll write over here. I guess I should have done that before. Uh, that we have a canonical isomorphism on all sigma. It goes from a product in this order to a product in this order. Okay? So these are all properties that you're familiar with from considering products of things that you already know from other contexts, for example, sets. Right? But they're true in general, is the point. Okay, so why did I tell you all of this? Because now we have enough structure to interpret yet another feature. of the proof theory of intuitionistic logic, well, propositional logic so far. So a propositional context is some kind of collection or list, or well, it depends on what kind of logic we're in, but in this case we'll say a list of, um, of propositions, which are sort of our local assumptions at some point in a, in a derivation. Right? So um, the smallest possible propositional context is the empty one with no assumptions. So I think Frank wrote this as a dot, but I'm going to write it as like the empty set. So I'm going to write it as a zero with strikes. And the interpretation of that will just be a terminal object, a nullary product. And if we have an extension of context, So if we have a context gamma and we extend it by a new assumption A, then we interpret that as the product of the interpretation of gamma and the interpretation of the new assumption. Okay? So this is the biased point of view, right? Because it's building the context up from nullary things and binary things, and by the associativity it means that it doesn't matter how we associate things up to isomorphism. But the unbiased point of view <coughs> just says that if gamma if gamma is this list of assumptions, A0 up to AN, let's say, then the interpretation of that context is the 
unbiased product, the NRA product of the assumptions. And, 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 and the reason why this is a bit desirable is that it doesn't force some kind of arbitrary association on the elements of our context, right? We don't have to fiddle around by saying, okay, we have to like reassociate all these things so we can get the thing we want, and then we might use uh, the symmetry to permute it to the end and do something else. We can just say, okay, I'll just write it out as a list and interpret it as a binary product. So now we can interpret the structural laws of context. And these structural laws are what distinguish the kind of uh, logic that we've been studying so far this week, which I guess also is called usually by proof theorists structural rather than say linear or something like that, right? Um, well, what distinguishes it from, from things like linear logic where contexts behave differently, right? So the point is that this is like prescribing the behavior of context, what you're allowed to do with context. So the best way to write these, to explain these are in what's called the, the localized form. Okay, so. so if we have, if from gamma we can infer A, right, so this is some derivation, then we interpret that as, as I said before, some morphism from the interpretation of gamma to the interpretation of A. And it's worse. <clears throat> so now there are, okay, so the laws of, of structural context are the following. So first we have what's called weakening seen this before already, right? And this says that if from gamma we can infer B, then from gamma together with the assumption A, we can also infer B. So I'm going to call this uh, context weakening. So we'll see what we'll here. Okay? So because this is true in the proof theory that we want to interpret, we need to come up with a way of transforming the interpretation of this thing into the interpretation of this thing. So let's see what that is. Up top we have, from the interpretation of gamma, we're assuming we have some arrow to the interpretation of B. Right? That's the input data. And what we want is an arrow from the interpretation of this to the interpretation of B. So that is the interpretation of gamma across the interpretation of A. And we want to get from here to here. Okay. So how can we do this? Well, it's pretty easy. We can just go from here to here by projection, and then compose with the thing we were given. Okay. So I'm okay. So we just do a projection, uh, and that'll do it. But for reasons of well, for reasons I'm going to right now, I'm going to do this slightly differently. I'm going to write this as going from the interpretation of gamma across the terminal object. And this is a nice homework here. Okay. And this is just the identity across a bank map. So it sends gamma to itself and it sends A to the terminal object. And then that's isomorphic we just saw to just the interpretation of gamma. Okay, but it's really just a projection. Okay? So this is how we think about weakening. Whenever we weaken a context, we just take the arrow that's interpreting the, the assumptions, and we pre-compose it with this arrow, and then we get the, the new interpretation of the derivation in the extended context. Okay, 
Next we have contraction. And this rule says that if from gamma and two copies of the assumption A, we can infer B, then from gamma and one copy of the assumption A, we can also infer B. So this is uh, context contraction. I'll write a little CC. Okay, so let's see what we need to do. It says that we assume that we can go from the interpretation of gamma cross the interpretation of A cross the interpretation of A to the interpretation of B. Okay, that's the assumption that we're given such homomorphism. And now what we want to do is go from the interpretation of gamma cross one copy of the interpretation of A to the interpretation of B. So we want an arrow from here to here. Well, we can use what we're given, right, to compose with it. So now we just have to come up with an arrow here that will let us do that. Well, going from gamma to gamma is pretty easy. Right? That's just the identity. <laughs> and now we have to cross that with a way of going from A to A cross A. But do you remember this canonical map that we discovered has to exist in every category with products? Remember what it was called? Diagonal. Right, the diagonal map. So we just do the diagonal map there, and then <coughs> we get an interpretation of the conclusion of the rule. Okay, I'm almost done for today. The next uh, structural rule is what's called context exchange. And that rule says that if from assumptions gamma together with B and A, I can infer C, then from assumptions gamma together with A and B, I can infer C. So context exchange, let's say. Okay, and we have to figure out how we can interpret this. Right? So the input is we're assuming that we have a map from interpretation of gamma cross the interpretation of B cross the interpretation of A to the interpretation of C. Okay? That's what we are given. And what we want is a map from the interpretation of gamma cross the interpretation of A cross the interpretation of B. To C. So we want to get from here to here. So again, the strategy is that we use what we're given and we just pre-compose something. So what should be that something? Okay, so someone probably hungry. It's so just the identity. And then we cross it with, well, we, we had a name for that thing. I guess it got erased. Oh, luckily it didn't get erased. Look at that. Uh, this, this symmetry map, right? <coughs> The symmetry map just switches the, the factors of the product. Uh, yes? Do you need, like, can't put a lot of game prime on the right? Is this seems like it's going to change things on the right prime? Sorry? Should it be gamma VA and then gamma prime after A? Oh, um, okay, let me think about this. I think it's okay, right? Because you can always just permute everything that you want to exchange to the end, put it in that four. Oh, no, you just make it a bad yeah. Hmm. As long as you can reassociate, that's a shame. Okay, let's think about that over lunch, but morally this is the right idea, right? And then we have to just check if this is okay, if, it's, if we can get things back. So we can always move something. Oh, wait. Okay, so let's think about that, okay? And answer it next time. And I guess I'll stop there because you're probably hungry. Um, let me just finish by saying, so the slogan I want to give you from today that the interpretation of structural
next. Um, I didn't use that word yet. Yeah, it's Okay, and I'll give you an exercise. Wait, one more thing. Sorry, I got your hopes up. There's two more structural rules, right? One is what Frank called ID. So it says that gamma together with A and for A. I'm kind of loath to call this ID because it's really not ID because the domain and codomain are different. So maybe I'll call this init or initial sequence rule or something like this. Right, so use the, the structure of Cartesian, oh, sorry, a finite product category to come up with an interpretation of this uh, structural rule. And finally, there's one that I guess Frank will talk about tomorrow that says that you can infer from gamma A. And if from gamma together with A, you can infer B. Then from gamma alone, you can infer B. So use the structure of finite products to come up with interpretations of these two rules, just like you did for the other structural rules. Okay, so if there's any questions or points of discussion, I'll take them. Last question. Sure. Before lunch question and after lunch Okay. Um, so we've been treating size uh, pretty loosely. Okay, so notice here, everything is going to be not only small, but countable even, right? Because propositions are like, you know, they range over an alphabet of, we have some alphabet of propositions that we're considering in our language, right? Usually our language is finitely be generated or at least inductively generated. And so, so we're going to be not only small, but really, really tiny, namely countable. So for everything I'm doing, the size, the foundational size, just doesn't matter. Any other questions or comments?